It's now my pleasure, and that's the right term, my pleasure, to introduce Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Jeff will be addressing us in a few minutes here as I introduce him. Jeff is my successor representing the first district in Nebraska. When I left uh, after 13 terms and decided not to seek re-election, Jeff uh, contested very successfully in a very uh, uh, spirited primary for the nomination to be the next congressman of the first district in Nebraska. And Jeff was quite successful in each year. Uh, he has been able to uh, increase that support within the district and, and make, a, make a real record of, of, of achievement in the U.S. House of Representatives. He now served in his sixth term. He, of course, uh, represents and serves on the Agriculture Committee, and that's important for a premier agricultural district like he and I represented. But he also, from the beginning, served on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And Jeff's interest in Africa, for example, became quite clear to everyone, and his expertise and has really grown. Beyond that, he also now focuses on South Asian issues. He serves on the House uh, Appropriations Committee and on the Agricultural Subcommittee dealing with nutrition issues. Please welcome uh, my successor from the 1st Congressional District in Nebraska, a real champion, a real leader for food security issues and child survival, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you, Congressman B. Ryder, for that overly generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all so much for the kind invitation. I was thinking about something last night, Congressman B. Ryder, you might be interested in this. We have an institution right up the road here that is starving for statesmanship. <clears throat> and when personages like Congressman B. Ryder retired, you lost a certain institutional continuity and a certain dignity uh, that is sorely missed. And I'll demonstrate this for you. When I was first running for office, I uh, had gone to the northern part of the district. There was an event in Norfolk, Nebraska. Because I didn't have anything along the way, I wore my casual clothes and brought my suit and tie. And when I got up there, I was just going to change from my jeans or shorts or whatever it was. And to my uh, horror, as I'm about to go on stage, I realized I have no shoes with me. And so I grabbed this friend of mine. I said, Dave, give me your shoes. His shoes were probably about two sizes too big for me. So I, I, he, I borrowed them and clopped up on the stage and kind of faked it till I made it. I, in so many ways, I felt the same way coming in to Congress and trying to fill the shoes of Doug B. Ryder, whose commitment to the institution, commitment to um, trying to pursue public policy with both dignity and forthrightness, honesty, but also with an end in mind of trying to get things done, is something that I think our own institution right now is grappling toward, and I think grappling with, and I think the American people want the institution to properly function and bring about constructive solutions. That's the spirit and the legacy of what Doug B. Ryder, I think, in addition to all of his policy impacts, what he brought to the institution. So thank you, Congressman, again, for inviting me here. Uh, last year, about this time, I was in a small town in Honduras. It's called Dos Caminos, Two Pathways. And there, there is a little bakery, and it's run by a group of women. And they started small with the help of some capital infusion from a major private multinational corporation named Cargill. Uh, they were shepherded with technical expertise by some non-governmental organizations. I believe the organization CARE was also included in that. This trip was uh, coordinated with the United States Agency for International Development. And we visited this place and watched in the 100 plus degree temperature, these women working fervently but enthusiastically because they owned something and they were beginning to see the fruits of their labor. This place has the highest murder rate in the world. In fact, one of the women working there had lost her husband to the violence just three weeks before. It's a place that's not facing starvation, but there's a kind of a benign, what I call a benign poverty, a sort of subsistence. You get along, life plods along, but there really is no chance for advancement. And here you have a new model that is emerging, a model of development, where you're looking at the coordination of private and public sector resources 
an inclusive form of capitalism using the best of what the market mechanisms can deliver by providing a little seed capital, expertise along the way, and empowering persons who would not have had any other option, any other way out of this. The young woman who was running it, who was effectively the CEO, looked like any other co-ed on an American campus. She was empowered, vibrant, alive. They wanted to expand their business. They had a regional and then a national plan, all from this little bakery that was operating in this area that is the source of such death and violence. Two pathways, one of poverty and despair, one of hope and opportunity. And it's working, but it's working because of the commitment of you and others who are thinking through new models of development to try to meet the growing demand for proper and nutritious food and are seeing the linkage between food security, national security, and international stability. The military tells me, send us in last. Do everything that you can do to build up trust and goodwill. And I believe in what's called a 3D policy. Development, diplomacy, and defense. And why do we do this? Congressman B. Ryder alluded, it, alluded to it. First of all, it's very hard for us in America to sit idly by while other people just die. That's not who we are. That's not the values of this country. Secondly, when we invest like this, we do benefit as well, economically and culturally from the exchange. And third is, by taking on endemic poverty, by immersing ourselves in places where there is no way out, we create the conditions for opportunity, the conditions for self-empowerment, the conditions for self-actualization that keep away, I think, twisted forms of nationalism or twisted forms of ideology, religious and others, that can distract and, and pull the mind and heart in another direction when there is not this opportunity for self-empowerment. And that's intimately tied to our national security because it helps create stability. The right thing to do, it benefits us and others economically and culturally. It creates the stability, a new framework for the 21st century as we face the various competing elements uh, that are pulling on the minds and hearts of people throughout the world. So I wanted to primarily congratulate you and thank, thank you for, for thinking deeply about this, particularly the malnutrition component of it, uh, which is in our own hemisphere in a very significant way. This trip to Honduras also included a look at the malnutrition, significant malnutrition problem in Guatemala. But we do this because it's right, it's good, it's just, and it, and it helps all peoples. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. I never thought in my life, having gone to Georgetown University and been one of the few persons ever at that point, if the only one to have looked at agricultural policy, I never thought agriculture would become cool. And here you are. <laughs> here we are. Thank you, Congressman B. Ryder, for your leadership. Thanks, everyone.